Well, we're concluding our study of the letters to Timothy by looking at the final two chapters of the second letter, or final letter, that Paul wrote. And for lack of another title, we'll call this Apostasy in the Last Days. And as most of you realize, of the main epistles, we have uh, Romans uh, and uh, Hebrews as main pillars, but there are actually seven churches that he wrote to, uh, and uh, then there are, and three, <clears throat> three of those were the prison epistles. But it's these three, or I should say four letters actually, that he wrote to the um, pastors. Uh, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. But let's just get, to, again, to give us sort of a refresher perspective of the whole picture. Paul was a major antagonist of the church, held coats while Stephen was stoned. He was converted on the road to Damascus and was in Damascus three years, during which he went to the Arabian desert for some indeterminate spe a spell of time where he was instructed by the Lord, apparently. And then he was forced, finally, to flee Damascus in a basket under attack. He spends the next 10 years in Tarsus, his hometown, where he was originally trained and so forth. 10 years. Until Barnabas seeks him out as he looks for leadership to help the church whose base was primarily in Antioch for the, that whole region. And uh, that led to his first missionary journey. And uh, after that journey completed, we have this main milestone event in Acts 15 called the Council in Jerusalem, which had dealt with these whole issues. What does a Gentile have to do to be, be saved? Does he have to become a Jew to do so? And the answer is no. And uh, then comes the second missionary journey. And it's on that journey that Timothy joins Paul, becomes a major uh, partner of his. Then there's the third missionary journey. But it finally turns out that he was arrested in Judea by the Romans to protect him because there was a big riot. And it becomes very clear to Paul that he's called to the Gentiles, not the Jews. That's where his heart was, is with his own countrymen. But he reluctantly recognizes that he's called to deal with the Gentiles, that it's Peter's call to be the primary reach out to the, to the uh, Jews. But he's imprisoned in Caesarea for a couple of years. But he finally ultimately appeals to exercise his Roman citizenship, which shocks many, many of them, and appeals to Caesar. And uh, he's on his way to Rome. He arranged to go to Caesar on government expense by getting arrested. And he's shipwrecked um, on his way to Rome. He's actually uh, three months there on, the, on Malta where they crashed. And uh, he finally ends up in Rome and he's in house arrest. And uh, it's during that house, and that's where the book of Acts ends. It sort of, it just, it just breaks off about the beginning of that imprisonment. And he, during that imprisonment, he's in house arrest. He's not uh, in, a, in, in, in behind bars, as we would think of it. And it's there that he writes the so-called prison epistles. They're called prison epistles because of that atmosphere, but they're actually, he's actually in a home. And he writes a letter to the Ephesians, to Philippians and Colossians that are three very treasured letters for lots of unique reasons. And... Uh, but he finally is acquitted of the charges, and he's released. And uh, it's after he re it's released that he wrote a letter to Timothy, his protege that's busy there in Ephesus, and uh, also Titus, which is a very similar letter. Uh, and uh, so, uh, he's, but he's again arrested finally and put in a dungeon, and he knows this is final. And it's during this time, in a real dungeon, under chains and so forth, that he wrote Second Timothy, his last letter. And uh, so he's in chains, he's treated as a criminal, he has very little light to read by, no sanitation, facing death. But other than that, everything's great. He's having a good time. And he knew his end was near. And it's very interesting. I, I, I continually get fascinated with the reality that under these dark circumstances, he's the one encouraging Timothy. You'd think it'd be the other way around. He'd been deserted by many of his associates in the, in the region. And, uh, but he fr freely forgave them. So it may not be counted against them, but so forth. But still, their cowardly attitude and so forth obviously hurt. He may have forgiven them, but the pain was still there, of course. So last time we talked about the afflictions and activity of the church. Now we're going to shift to the allegiance to the church. It's going to shift to a more positive direction, perhaps. So 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to talk about apostasy in the last days. In the universe, there is God, and there are people and things. We should worship God love the people, and use things. If we start worshiping ourselves, ignoring God, and start loving things and using people, we got it all mixed up. That's exactly what we do. That's the formula for a miserable life. 
worship ourselves, ignore God, start loving things and using people. Big mistake. We've got the verbs and the predicates uh, a little mixed up there. Listen also that in the last days, perilous times will come. You're probably saying, no kidding, Dick Tracy. Yeah, we've got that figured out by now. Perilous times, dangerous, hard to deal with, savage is what the word means. The same word was used to describe the violent demoniacs at Gadara. Same word, perilous. Very, very descriptive word in the Greek. This suggests the violence of the last times will be energized by demons. That's the overtone here. The word perilous implies a demonic participation. And back in Acts chapter 20, Paul previously had warned the Ephesian elders that the apostasy would start even back then. Now it doesn't look like, either from the scripture or from observing, that we're going to see a conversion of the world. We don't think there's a very bright future for the organized church. I'm always reminded by a thing I read when I was a, just a teenager, I think, in some magazine. Um, uh, Satan and another guy were walking down the street. In correction, two guys were walking down the street, and behind them, Satan and this Christian were walking. And up front, one of the two guys gave the other guy some truth. And he watched Satan say he didn't do anything. They said, did you see what he did? He gave him some truth. And Satan is quoted as saying, don't worry about it. If it gets serious, I'll organize it. So, the last days for Israel, the end of the age, the time of the end, the great tribulation, the last days, the last days of the church, immediately preceding the harpazo, the rapture. These are both, in both cases, last, the last days for Israel are described a certain way, the last days of the church a little differently. The Bible does not teach that the church will bring in the millennium and convert the world. That's a misconception that's widely held throughout our, 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 group, our groups and stuff. We're going to instead see 19 descriptions that are going to follow here, which of course are appearing today. You want to see what the world's going to be like? It's the, it's, Paul is about to describe them to Timothy. They're certainly true then, but you can decide whether they're descriptive of today or not. Paul paints a picture that's going to get worse, not better. And the heart of every one of the problems he's going to mention is the heart. The heart. Notice the next 19 indicators. He starts in, in uh, verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And he's just getting warmed up here, okay? Lovers of own self, self-lovers. Covetous, really, lovers of money is what the word really means. Boasters, swaggers, proud. The very word proud really is the word haughty. Blasphemers, or even more precisely, railers. Disobedient to parents. See, an attacks on the family are part of Satan's strategy. Unthankful, and the word also implies uncourteous, if you will. Unholy or profane. That's all pretty straightforward, isn't it? See, they're actually against God in their conversation and manner of life, both. He continues, next verse, without natural, natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. The list goes on here, see? We're now to number nine. Without natural affection. Homosexuality, homosexuality being accepted as normal. See, the great sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality. It was the condoning of homosexuality. It's a judgment of God against a culture that denies him as creator. That's what Romans chapter 1, verse 20 to the end of that chapter spells out. I was startled to discover that. I always thought homosexuality in the individual sense as a sin. Indeed it is. But I never thought of it as a judgment. Because four times in Romans chapter 1, verse 20 and following, four times as God gives them over to that as a judgment. So it really surprised me. In any case, though, we have truce breakers. That's what keeps the lawyers employed, right? And uh, the, ch the change in atmosphere on Wall Street and boardrooms is increasingly obvious. I spent 30 years in, the, in public boardrooms, and uh, it was a different day back then. That was over 17 years ago, so I'm out of date. In those days, there was an ethic that made everything work. 
that obviously is starting to get very frayed. False accusers, slanderers. And it's disturbing that it's not only a characteristic of our time, it's a characteristic within the body of Christ. There are ministries that continually libel and slander other ministries. They call themselves Christians. There is a procedure in Matthew 18 and elsewhere for you, you bring an elder. We talked about that earlier in, one of the, earlier in the epistles, but it's um, disturbing to see the flagrant uh, deceits and slander on the radio and libel in the print of, 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 by Christians of other Christians. It's absolutely disgusting. That tells you, when A says something about B, it doesn't tell you much about B, it tells you a lot about A. Even within the page of a Christmas problem. Anyway. Incontinent. That, what that really word means is without self-control. Without self-control. That's characteristic of our present society. Continually. Fierce. The word really means savage, untamed, brutal. Does not describe our culture. The news broadcasts are full of the most astonishing misbehavior of people against people. Our, even our schools are unsafe, even in the daytime. Continues, despisers of those that are good. When people are good, they get despised. That's always disturbing. It's always disturbing. In fact, to be more precisely translated, haters of the good. Haters of the good. People who are good are despised by the culture, by the media, what have you. Traitors, high, uh, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Traitors are really betrayers, is what it really means. And um, there are some people you wouldn't trust, even those that are in the body of Christ. That's disturbing to realize that that's just, that's just reality. Heady, it is heady, that's really uh, reckless, if you will. High-minded, again, that's a pride issue, blinded by pride or conceited. Lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God. Boy, uh, how many of us are, are guilty of that. Characteristic of our whole age, we're the entertainment society. Measure the budgets for entertainment and compare them with charitable commitments. It's a joke. It's a joke. You have to move the decimal place three, you know, four or five times probably in the comparison. Having a form of God in us, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Having a form of God in us. We, we may probably weren't counting, but that's 19 specific attributes that Paul warned Timothy about, but I think all of us realize they're characteristic of today, and, it's, and not only that, it's getting worse. We're not only decaying, the rate of decay is accelerating. But denying, form, having a form of God in us, but denying the power of, boy, that's our churches. We have a form of God in us, but they deny the power. The power is in the blood. You don't hear the blood preached, the blood of Christ. From such, turn away. Rituals without reality, without life. If you're in a dead, cold, liberal church, and if you're a real believer, what are you doing there? The Word of God says to avoid such things. I know many of my good friends of the past um, felt that the church they're in was their ministry. They, saw, they were fully aware of its deficiency, of its problems, of major denominational church, the social church of that particular area we lived in at that time, and they were there in the hopes of somehow making a difference. And 20 years later, attending the national conventions of that denomination for that church and being very active, virtually ready to give up. They accomplished zero. It's really kept them from being fruitful in many ways. From such turn away, the scripture says. For of this sort are they that creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How do they creep into houses? Shall I tell you how? On television channels. Seriously. Lives evidence the real condition. Never matured, lives unchanged is the description here. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, those are the names of the two priests that were with Pharaoh in the confrontation with Yule Brenner there in Exodus uh, 
chapter 20, okay? No, I'm kidding, of course, about that. Not Exodus 20, 12. Actually, Exodus earlier, uh, 10, 11, 12. Janus and Jambres. Apparently, these were the names of the magicians that many people ask get quick questions about that. Did they, you know, what about these snakes? Okay, Moses took a staff down and became a snake. They did the same thing. Well, everybody assumes that was just parlor tricks of some kind. Until Moses' snake ate theirs. Well, what's that? Sounds like, it sounds like a folk tale or a fable. No, this is the Word of God we're talking about. What people don't make allowances for is that Satan is capable of miracles. Miraculous works. We're not ready for that. We always assume if it's a miracle, it's all of God. Not necessarily. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate according to faith. And uh, now, this is Exodus 7 and 8 that we have Janus and Jambres. And they actually did miracles. And there was, well, they finally got to the lice thing, and that's when they couldn't, that's when they went to, Pharaoh panicked. Because they realized that Moses' ma magic was way beyond theirs. And that gets into a whole study of Egyptology. I won't take the time here. But you can get into our Exodus commentary if you want. Satan does miracles. And on top of that, he is the great imitator. Most Christians underestimate the degree to which Satan himself intervenes and manipulates in your life. He can, you know, he, I don't think he can read minds, but he can plant thoughts. Only God knows the thoughts and tents of the heart, the scripture tells us. Well, I get that. That's another question I get a lot. Can Satan read our minds? I don't think so. He probably is a great observer, and he can draw a lot of good inferences. But I don't believe he has. Only God knows the thoughts and tents of the heart. But he certainly can't plant issues. Reprobate concerning the faith, tested and found counterfeit. That's what reprobate concerning the faith Found counterfeit, boy. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly will be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. See, Paul's life, in contrast, was an open book, as every Christian's life ought to be, an open book. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. He's, Timothy was his partner. They traveled together. He knew him well. But you know, as Paul talks about his own personal profile here, it would be a very interesting exercise for a student to draw up a resume of Paul. You know, compare his resume to somebody you might be thinking of hiring for a position in ministry. He had an extensive prison record. He had a physical affliction, made it hard to read. He stirred up problems wherever he went. There were uprisings. He was poor. He did not cater to the rich. And so forth. You can go, it'd be fun to go through life by and put that resume together. It's, re, it's pretty funny. What are the characteristics of a good leader? Well, he's got to be able to teach godly principles. He's got to be a teacher. He's got to be a communicator. And he must know the scriptures. He must be able to teach godly principles. That's one of the requirements of a good leader. He must conduct himself in a manner that glorifies God. These are pretty basic you must have a personal mission statement which lines up with God's will. What's your mission statement? Do you have a mission statement? Draft one. Write, write a note to yourself and, and, and you know, evaluate your uh, gifts according to this list. Your teaching skills. Do you have them? Do you know? Have you tried? Do you conduct yourself in a way that glorifies God? Do you have a personal mission statement at all? Encourage that. And of course, you must be a man of faith, which also implies you're a man of prayer. Do you really spend serious time in prayer? Or is it a quick 15 minutes here and 15 minutes there, and that's it, and on you go? Or do you have a specific, serious regimen of prayer? Are you sensitive to God's timing, or are you in a hurry? You know, that's, that's, I, I'm a Peter, ready, fire, aim, you know, and shoot first and think about it later kind of guy, and I've got to watch that. And, of course, love. If you want to understand more about that, my wife's got written a fabulous book. It's gone all over the world. In fact, it's even in Target, I understand. Yeah. The Way of Agape now is in Target drugstore. Um, perseverance. Another way of saying the same thing, he knows that God is in control. That gives you perseverance. 
You know, it's interesting. I've, I've spent 30 years in the corporate management world, and I've read a lot of books and studies about success. And there's one, one attribute that is always at the head of the list of any serious study. There have been many of them, and they all agree. It's not intelligence. It's not education. There's a whole bunch of good things to have, but they're not at the top of the list. The main thing that distinguishes a winner in, in management, what have you, is perseverance, stick to itiveness. People who go the course. And uh, that's high on any, anybody, any serious list. And there's other characters, a good leader, persecution, sufferings, and so forth. Jesus promised that, that would come. In the infantry, they'll tell you, stay away from the tanks. Because that tanks will draw the heavy fire. Okay? If you're on foot and near one of those, be careful. You may have to be, but I mean, what I'm saying is that uh, the bigger the tank, the heavier, uh, heavier shells that are being aimed at it, so to speak. Persecuted and suffering. If you're not persecuted and suffering, is there some strange reason, maybe? You're not, you're, not, you're not a threat to Satan, I guess. That could be the answer. Anyone that doesn't believe in Satan should try opposing him for a while. Yep. So, Paul makes that remark. Even though I had, I had those characteristics, I still suffered. In other words, just because you have all these characteristics doesn't mean you'll be spared persecution and sufferings. He continues, verse 11, Persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. That was Paul's claim. At Lystra, by the way, we talk about suffering. He was left for dead. He was stoned and left for dead. Some scholars even think he may have died and been resurrected. And that's a speculation. Who knows? And so uh, that God raised him. He could have. Maybe he did. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's a promise you can count on. Yes, even here in America. It's going to cost to be a Christian. Even here in America. It's been a free ride for a long time. Those days are ending. Melvin Laird, former Secretary of Defense, got a very interesting quote picked up from him. In this world, it's becoming more and more unpopular to be a Christian. Soon it may become dangerous. He said this several decades ago, and it's becoming true. And what about persecution? How do you persecute a group? There's a classic five-step program to persecute a group. It's worth understanding. How do you persecute a group? Well, first you have to identify your target group. Who are you going to persecute? You've got to identify who they are. Okay. Then you need to marginalize that group. Make them somehow dis distinctive and separate and marginalized. Then you start vilifying this target group. Then you pass laws against the beliefs or activities of that target group. And then you simply enforce the laws. That's the way the Nazis did it to the Jews in Germany. Identified them, of course. They marginalized them. Then they vilified them. Then they passed laws against those things which the Jews did. And then they enforced the laws. When the Gestapo broke down the door of the home in the middle of the night and took away the head of the family down into prison, they were not breaking the law. They were enforcing it. That was not an unlawful act. By then they had so many rules and laws and stuff, they could do anything. Anyway. Verse 13, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Seducers. Also the term means imposters. Leading many astray. And I'm going to suggest that includes presidents and congressmen, what have you. No one's immune. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That's your anchor. See, adults need guidance even more than children do. Did you know that? Because their opportunities and perils are far more significant. So they need guidance even more. The, the more... Uh, opportunities you have, the more guidance you need. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What, what a wonderful thing. Timothy had, been, had grown from a child. He knew his Scriptures. He may have been a, a little timid. He may have a little been a little standoffish, but he was well grounded. So Paul put him to good use. The only antidote against all of these things is the Word of God. The only antidote is against the Word of God. And it's the extensive biblical illiteracy within the body of Christ that has caused the Coin Institute to be formed. A think tank for any Christian that is serious about being an ambassador can be participant in it. 
but it's to, the, the primary goal is to repair the biblical illiteracy within the body of Christ. Make thee wise unto salvation. Boy, boy, boy. Remember, there are three tenses to salvation. The past tense, separation from the penalty of sin. The present tense, separation from the power of sin. And the future tense, separation from the presence of ten. ten. Past, present, and future, penalty, power, and presence. We call the past tense justification. You're justified by Christ. He did 100% of the job. If you trust Christ, you are saved in a past tense sense, and that's, that endures. Present tense of salvation we call sanctification. And that's a process, not an end. That because, that's what happens once you're justified, then you have the Holy Spirit to guide you and grow you into being separated from the power of sin. The sin does no longer, no longer reigns in your life. You may stumble here and there, but you have the power to overcome that through the Holy Spirit. And that leads to the future tense, which is called glorification, separation from the presence of sin. The definitive study of all of this, of course, is in the Epistle to the Romans. But we'll, we, all three of these things, justification, sanctification, glorification, being the three tenses, if you will, of what we could loosely call salvation. Salvation is a, a very difficult term because it can mean many things to many people. You can be saved from a burning building. You can be saved from the visit of your mother-in-law. There are all kinds of things you can be saved from. But when we use the word salvation, we normally mean theologically. That's why using these three are more definitive. So I encourage you to be more precise in your thinking about this. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous. When you, re when you trust Christ, you're saved, but you may not have changed at all yet. But you will if you have been saved. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. Those are the differences. That brings us to verse 16. 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy, last letter Paul. 3.16, you can't forget. John 3.16. A lot of 3.16s in the Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture. Does that say most Scripture? All Scripture. Important word. All Scripture. Is given by... The inspiration of God. These guys sort of were inspired and sort of reflected what they thought about God. No, no. The Greek word there actually means God breathed. And there's substantial evidence to indicate he breathed every letter. He somehow, the letters themselves have properties that are impossible to simulate with a computer. That's another whole thing I won't get into here. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for four, th four different things. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. What are those four things? What, doctrine, what's right? For reproof, that's what's not right. For correction, how to get it right. And for instruction, how to stay right. That helps maybe with those four words, maybe? Okay. For instruction and righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And um, see, the all scripture, it, it doesn't mean that it contains the word of God. No, it is the word of God. And uh, so if you put man in there, the role of editor, you, you're just selecting what he agrees with, um, sort of reminds you of W.C. Fields. When they noticed he was studying the Bible, he said, what are you doing? Looking for loopholes. <laughs> Perfect, complete, fitted for use, mature. Mature. Completion in the sense of being mature. Okay, we're in the last chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is his deathbed testimony. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That's kind of an interesting word. At his appearing, and that's when the kingdom is established. The kingdom of God. We take that so for granted. No you see, Paul was alone, incarcerated in the Mamertine prison in Rome. His final appointment was, you know, we're all going to die on time, by the way. Did you know that? All of us. Not early, not late. God knows what he's doing. We each have an appointment. And our final exam has also been scheduled. Ooh. Yes, we should be cramming for our final. Paul continues, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. 
Be instant. The word really means diligent or maybe urgent. There's an urgent diligence implied by that. He doesn't say preach from the word. A lot of pastors say, I preach from the word every Sunday. No, 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 uh uh-uh. Preach the word. That's not the same as preaching from the word. You preach the word. What does the word of God say? I respect those pastors who have a program for their churches in which the pastor leads the church verse by verse throughout the entire Bible through their church here. He doesn't pick a topic here and a topic here, that's fine. No, he preaches the word, verse by verse, book, chapter by chapter, book by book. Some of them, he may glide over, summarize a little bit, perhaps. But the idea is you preach the word of God, not from the word, you preach the word of God. And all your other problems will ultimately be dealt with as you do that. But a text is a pretext that's taken out of context. That sometimes happens. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, it says reprove, with conviction that is. Rebuke. The word actually means threaten. <laughs> exhort with all long-suffering. God. Exhort. The word exhort, by the way, really means comfort. I have an exhortation for you. No, no, I should be comforting you on some issue. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's Laodicea today. Not enduring sound doctrine. That's our church today. They don't want sound doctrine. That sounds old-fashioned and corny. Again, we're too modern for that sort of thing. They have, but they have itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto what? Fables. You know, it really fascinates me. You get in discussions with some, what I'll call pseudo-intellects. They think they know everything. They've turned away from the Bible because they've decided they've studied that and that doesn't make sense for whatever reason. Okay. Look what they ultimately turn to. They will later, you'll run into them again a year later or something, and they will be into the most stupid, vapid, empty things you can imagine. All this scholarly skepticism has gone out the window. They're into whatever, and t- 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 under fables. It's fascinating to me. Because, you see, it's not an intellectual exercise, it's a spiritual exercise. These people commit themselves to the noise rather than signal. You know, as an engineer, you speak of signal and noise ratio. The randomness, the noise, is that which you don't want. In there, there's the signal that you try to pull out of the noise. That's the whole idea of, of communication and receivers and what have you. Well, they can commit themselves to the noise rather than the signal. That's basically what they're doing. The ultimate fable is attributing their very origin to a random accident. Well, we just happened. Yes, we're skillfully designed, but that just happened by accident. And then they adopt that view, and then they wonder why they have no sense of destiny. We teach our kids in school that they're here by some cosmic accident, and then we wonder why... They have no sense of purpose or sense of destiny. How can they have if they're just a random accident? It used to be the classic challenge before the educational system was to discover truth. And we've twisted this whole thing around in the last few decades to deny the very existence of truth. Well, if you're denying the existence of truth, (laughs) then why learn anything? Why learn history? Why learn literature? You're wasting your time. There is no truth. The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom. The book came out some years ago. It's worth reading. It's amazing the ellipsis that's taken place because as we deny the existence of truth, we've closed our mind to all learning. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. And he's going to be Poured out like a drink offering, really. Departure. This is not the same word as in 1 Thessalonians. I won't go into that here. It's a different word altogether, anyway. But uh, analusis, an unloosing. And um, it's uh, very much like uh, loosing when you remove the dock lines of a boat taking off on a, on a, on a cruise. It's at the dock. You take the bow line, the stern line, you're unloosing. It's that, that, that's the same concept of the word in the Greek. Um, I am... My departure is at hand, like a ship ready to leave the dock. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept... Paul loved these athletic metaphors. 
I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Really, what on earth is that? That's a crown that is because he fought a good fight, finished his court, etc. A crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. He's a good combat soldier. See, it's not only a battle, it's also a race. He's out to win a prize. And he's also a good steward. He's going to deal with all of those in his other letters, by the way. Crowns. Let's talk about these crowns. There's a crown of life that James talks about, shows up in Revelation 2, for those that have suffered for his sake. There's a crown that not all of us are going to get. Some of us have been managed to get through life without suffering for Christ in an overt, strong way. Well, the ones that have are going to get a crown of life, apparently. There's a crown of righteousness that we've just read just now for those who loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing? I hope so. The crown of glory for those who fed the flock. Have you fed the flock of God? Have you done something to help your brothers in Christ grow and learn and strengthen? Crown of glory. A crown incorruptible for those who press on steadfast. If you're steadfast, there's another crown. I don't happen to believe that these are the only five crowns. They might all be the same crown. I don't know. But these are the way they're expressed in the scripture. There's a crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. And I'd be hard-pressed to define which one comes if the, and excludes the other. These all sort of mesh. So there may be 20 different crowns. These are four, five that happen to be mentioned expressly in the Scripture. So I'm not here to make a big, you know, big paradigm out of these crowns, except to realize there are crowns that will be earned. Earned. And that's why I, want to, I think the key point here is that I think everybody at the judgment seat of Christ is going to have a different result. Different Positives or different negatives? See, we're dealing here with inheritance, not salvation. Everyone before the judgment seat of Christ is saved. That's why they're there. But there is an issue of inheritance. See, for centuries, theologians have fought the wrong battle. The Calvinism versus Arminians. They say, once saved, always saved. On the one hand, or conditional salvation, that you're not saved unless you stick it out to the end. See, the problem is the difference between justification, which enters heaven, and sanctification, which determines your, the degree of your inheritance. We need to understand who the metakoi are. They're the partakers. If you visualize this as a path between two mountains, over here we have the Calvinists, and over here we have the Arminians. They're both true in what they assert, they're both wrong in what they deny. What path are we on? On the partakers, the right up between. S justified by Christ alone. You contribute nothing to that. But your contribution is to earn your inheritance that then accrues to that. Who are the metakoi? They're the select ones. They are the joint heirs with Christ. 2 Timothy uh, 2, from 11 to 13, and then there's a path in Hebrews also. You and I also, you can also be disqualified from the prize. You're saved. But there are prizes that you get disqualified from. There's all kinds of verses on that. Let's take a look at a couple of these. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all, that's we, we the believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That doesn't determine salvation. It's already assumed if you're there, you're saved. I'll show you the next in 1 Corinthians 3. But Paul, just to talk about 1 Corinthians 9 for a minute, Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. What? Paul says, I myself should be a castaway. Paul was paranoid. Was he afraid he was going to lose his salvation? Of course not. He wrote the book on that. Romans 8 and elsewhere. He knew he was saved. That's not his concern here. He's concerned that he may forfeit his inheritance. That may I preach to others, and I myself might be a castaway, have missed the mark. 1 John 2.8. John says a similar thing. 
And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his co- uh, coming. Can you be ashamed? Apparently, it's possible. Do not be ashamed before his coming. And Hebrews 6, 11 and 12. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Through faith and patience inherit the promises. You're not talking about salvation. You can't earn your salvation. You're talking about inheritance. Made more clear in Hebrews 3. For we are made partakers of Christ. Partakers. That's that word metakoi. A partaker. For we are made partakers of Christ if, big word, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You want to hang on all the way through the end. Metakoi. The word means those who share in, companions, comrades, partners in a work, officer, dignity. If we hold the, the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So we need, there is a part of this picture that you earn. Not your salvation, that's a gift of God. I should be more precise. Not your justification, that's done by Christ, 100%. So, anyway, Paul continues in 2 Timothy. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved his present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, and Titus unto Dalmatia. See, Paul is lonesome. These people are running off. Now, Crescens, by the way, is the, you try to investigate some of these people. Obviously, Demas, you know, forsook forsa- him. Crescens went off to Galatia. He may have been, some scholars believe he was one of the 70 that are spoken of in the Gospels. They, there's also traditions that he founded the church in Vienna. But uh, these are without any real trustworthy basis. They're just uh, traditions within the church literature. Paul continues, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now, Mark here, uh, uh, Mark here is John Mark. That is his Jewish name. Mark was his Roman name, okay? And uh, it's interesting. It's been more than 10 years since they had the big argument. Barnabas and Paul had a big dispute over Mark and split up. That breach had separated Paul and Barnabas. It apparently has now healed, and Mark has earned his spurs with Paul. He apparently, being very Jewish was unwilling to go up into Galatia. That's where he balked and went home. Or in, was it in Cyprus? Anyway, uh, uh, he, he left for whatever reason. He split off. And, and, and uh, Paul and Barnabas really, uh, I mean, uh, Paul really was upset by that. And Barnabas takes, Paul, uh, takes uh, Mark under wing. And that's when Paul picks up Silas. And they, they had this, this big dispute. Because apparently Paul looked at Mark as a young, spoiled background. He was very, come from a very wealthy family. And there are traditions that he might have been the young man that fled Gethsemane in the linen and all that, uh, virtually naked, etc. There's, uh, there's, there's a lot of inferential suggestions about Mark. But in any case, he was young and from a wealthy background, and apparently Paul had disdain for him because he just didn't, st- from Paul's point of view, didn't stay the course. He apparently re-earned his spurs, so to speak, and by now, ten years later, he is, Paul ign- reinstates him. It says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So Paul's forgiven Mark for whatever it's worth. After Paul's death, Mark becomes Peter's amanuensis, or secretary, comedy. The, the gospel of Mark is really Peter's, Peter's gospel. Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Paul had trusted Tychicus to deliver the circular letters, not just to all proconsular Asia. Ephesians, Laodicea, and Laodicea and Colossians were about one mile apart. They're not very far away from each other. But Tychicus delivers those epistles. And in Colossus, Tychicus would plead the case of Onesimus, who had accompanied him from Rome. Onesimus is uh, the runaway slave that he writes to Philemon to take back and so forth, and that, that there's a very charming example of intercession in this little letter that Paul writes to Philemon on the case of Onesimus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, especially the parchments. Troas was a chief city in northwest Asia, uh, Asia Minor, that is, and, and uh, it was on the coast of Asia in the Roman pro- it, When we say Asia, we mean the Roman province of Asia. It was at Troas that Paul raised uh, Eutychus from the dead, back in Acts 20. 
We're not sure who Carpus was as we try to search the literature, uh, but it's clear that Paul had a lot of confidence in him, not only just because his cloak is there, but because these priceless books and parchments were left there. I want to talk about them briefly. Paul uses here, in verse 13, a technical term, membrane, which is a Latin word that was transcribed into Greek, referring to a parchment notebook. You need to understand that up till now, people use scrolls. That's why I use all the Old Testament. I use a little idea, you know, obviously scrolls to Old Testament and a little parchment for New Testament. Just as we pop back and forth, people are conscious of my own older New Testament. That's why I use that little style thing in the, in the graphics here. But the point is, right about now, people are discovering parchments and we, they put them in the form of pages in a book rather than scrolls. It's a lot more practical. You can find your way around. So those, that's called a codex, or codice is a plural, but codex. And uh, uh, so the, it, the, what, what Paul is talking about here, the membrane may have been a predecessor to what we now know as a codex, or what you and I would call a book, in contrast to a scroll. And uh, they're written on, see, because they were written writing on both sides of the parchment, they were small, often roughly pocket-sized, and uh, obviously a lot easier to handle, you can skip around and, and so forth. And so that led ultimately to a departure from the whole concept of scrolls. And so, uh, now, the other thing, you and I tend to take for granted the uh, information appliances we have today. We make copies of documents with a machine, in color if we like. In the ancient world, all copies had to be done by hand. That's why they call them manuscripts. It's a script by hand. That's what the word manuscript means. It's handwritten. You and I probably have no real capacity to imagine the significance of what happened in the 15th century when Johannes Gutenberg invented movable type, which led to the field of printing. Can you imagine assembling the Bible letter by letter with little pieces of lead? That's what they did. And, and, uh, and that ushered in a whole revolution. That allowed people who never had their hands on a Bible to get copies, get access to them. And so by doing a moving type, I won't get into all technology, but basically the moving type is what led to what we know today as printing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, the traditional form. Let's realize the technology that led to the Reformation, Gutenberg's Bible, in effect. With the technology we have today, the technologies of today. We have information appliances where we can carry a telephone and in, as an incidental feature of this telephone, I carry six Bibles. They're searchable in Greek or Hebrew. I've got several Bible dictionaries. I have the New American Standard. I have, an, I have anyway, three handful. I think six different translations. Word searchable. And it's in my phone. So if I'm, if I'm 15 minutes early to an appointment, I can sit there and, you know, knock off something. See? The PDA, personal distri uh, uh, digital assistant. Computers. My laptop that I travel with on a plane. I have more books in that, in that thing that, than in most libraries, and I can search them word search, other word searchable. I don't have to read the Antonicene Fathers, 30 volumes, to find out what Eusebius said about what. I can go through and ask it, and it'll tell me. It'll pick those places. I can also ask it to summarize. If I have a 30-page essay, I can put a summarized thing, and it'll highlight the important 25% of that. You say, how does it do that? By statistics. A word, a mechanical linguistics. Podcast. We're getting into some of these. There, you, know, you, know, you know what kilobytes are, right? Gigabytes. That's 1,000 kilobytes. Terabytes. That's 1,000 gigabytes. You know what those are? Those are, you know, you know what a byte is. That's a typewriter stroke, in effect. Right? Do you know what a mobite is? <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. Did you get it? Oh, took a, that is so bad, I had to work it in. I can use Hebrew and Greek without knowing Hebrew and Greek with my computer. It'll diagram the sentences for me. If I put my cursor on any English word, it'll tell me what's behind that in Greek or Hebrew or whatever, and so on. Then there's the Internet. Unfathomable resource on the Internet. You can find out anything on the Internet, if you know how. And... Uh, you also can participate in a borderless fellowship around the world. When you get into one of our classrooms of 12 people, they can be from any of 17 countries. And you get to know them, amazingly enough. Let's talk a little bit about advanced media, and, and so just to give you a feeling for what's possible here. MP3, on, on a single CD, you can get 30 hours 
of audio plus notes plus 1,500 computer-aided diagrams. And one little, you know, and DVDs, you're all familiar with DVDs, but think of how phenomenal that is. The Blue Letter Bible on the Internet. Free! I'll give you some. You can not only get, any, get anywhere in the Bible you want, there's a little place you can click, and it'll give you treasury of scriptural knowledge. It'll give you a concordance in either Greek or Hebrew, a list of the audio, a study tools, all a list of all the commentaries that are available that you can then take a look at. It gives you hymns and maps and judges that involve that verse. Give you all kinds of versions and translations and dictionary aids. They're all there. You just click, and they're there. Okay? Then that's, that's, that's available to you free on the Internet. We helped get that started. But uh, on your computer, there is a number of things. eSword is terrific, powerful, and it's free. Libronix has a huge library of thousands of volumes that you can add to it if you like. BibleSoft is probably the most incredible search machine you could imagine. You can ask it to give me all, show me the verses where the word sword is there, but the word father is not within three spaces, three verses of it. Not that that's useful. And it'll, it'll take less than a second and tell you which, it, that fit those criteria. In any language, the Greek, the Hebrew, the English, what have you. It's probably the exegete's main tool by hermeneutica. We call it Bible stuff. It's probably the thing I use the most that happens. Got used to it. Okay. But this is e-sword. You can, you can cl click on any of the verses, or you can click on the, the, uh, the uh, Strong's number and so forth, and it'll, it'll uh, zero right in. There's a whole bunch of, I won't, I won't, uh, in terms of uh, the different verses, and it'll diagram those and, and highlight the key words and what they mean. And it's all interactive as you do this. It's all free, by the way. You can load it on your computer free. And uh, it'll copy the verses, of course, and put it into your word process or whatever. And uh, you take an international standard version. You can't get it in the market yet, but it's in, it's in the computer. So if you want to look at a, at a modern, uh, competent uh, translation of it. And uh, so, but uh, it gives you all the list of verses that affect that same thing. And uh, on it goes, it goes. So, how, and if you click on any particular verse, it'll tell you what that, that's referring to. It'll give you that verse, pop it up for you. What did it say? Oh, yeah, right, gotcha. So... And you can go to the Strong's numbers if that's more comfortable. You don't have to know the Hebrew or Greek, but it'll explain what that means and so forth. And so on it goes. I, 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 won't, I don't want this to be a whole... You know, it'll contrast the King James, the International Standard, New SV, whichever translations you want. This is all free. This is eSword. Okay? And uh, it'll also uh, give you the, you know, the commentary stuff and so forth. And, uh, and Oh, and by the way, it'll also give you highlighted the relevant parts of that, if you want. So, and maps and all that sort of thing where you can find your way around that in itself is incredibly valuable. And Libronix has another thing where you have literally thousands of commentaries that are all, you, you mention a verse and it'll open all the commentaries in your collection to that, the comments on that verse that you can just pop through that if you want. And uh, you can do in about 30 minutes what it used to take six months by using conventional t t tools. This is Bible Works. This is the one I use the most of. And uh, it's just, again, I, I'm not here to make a thing for that. But there's something else, the little PDA, where you've got, say, the, the, the Bible in it. And uh, there's something else you can do. You can, eSword has a free version for this. There's two software companies that make software for these, Liridian and Olive Tree. They're both outstanding. They're both, you can't buy anything in them that costs more than 10 or 20 or $30. They're not expensive to buy this and that, the different things you want. But not much. So they're very inexpensive, and some are even free. Um, and uh, again, this is eSword on one of these. And, uh, uh, but I want to talk about podcasting. You have an iPod? How many know what an iPod is? Okay, it's 70%. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, the iPod. Um, on the internet, you can automatically have your co personal computer updated with the study of the week. And it will automatically put that on your iPod while you're recharging your iPod. You got your iPod, at the end of the day you plug it in your charger, your personal computer can update the study of the week on there, and that now in today's world can include video. So you can watch or listen while you're jogging, you can get your you know, 60 minute Bible study in while you're jogging or whatever. So those are the tools.
Let's get back to, let's get back to Paul. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Paul had previously delivered him to Satan back in 1 Corinthians 5 and, and 2 Corinthians 12. Because he withstood the apostles. And he made a shipwreck of faith and even, bla was even blasphemed with Himenaeus, who we talked to talked to a little while ago. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Can you imagine how that must have felt? I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Sounds like Stephen, doesn't it? Hmm? Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, and by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. What lion do you think he's talking about? Satan, good for you, exactly. He goes about as a roaring lion. I believe that's the idiom. I don't, I'm not saying he didn't get saved from big lion, but you don't have to go that far to uh, not do violence to the passage. But he was forgiving even to the end. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. What does that tell you about the kingdom? It's yet future. It's not there yet. See, it's a few, it, when Christ, the kingdom is when he returns to establish his kingdom, is my point I'm trying to get here. Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Priscilla is the endearment form of Prisca, by the way. So it's Priscilla and Aquila, you're familiar from, it comes up many times, I think five or six times in, in the letters. And Aquila uh, was the native of Pontus, doubtless one of the colony of Jews mentioned in Acts 2 and 1 Peter 1. They're refugees from the Edict of Claudius who, who uh, ordered all Jews out of Rome, so they had to leave Rome. That gets relieved and they get back to Rome and they see Paul. But the point is, they were expelled in the... Fi 50 to 52 AD was the period of time that uh, there was this big purge in Rome for Jews. Paul will meet them all in Corinth in Acts 18. They're the ones that taught Apollos the correct way in Ephesus in Acts 18. Now... Uh, and is, uh, he'd come from Ephesus to Rome. It was to Paul that the church at Ephesus owed its entire origin, and he was very sensitive to that. They were, they were very, very uh, appreciative of the fact their existence as, as believers, they indebted to Paul. And so uh, they knew that they were indebted uh, to Paul because that's how they got to know Christ. So Onesiphorus is almost like an a, a, um, ambassador from them in that regard. When he learned that Paul was in prison, he sought him out, and apparently at great risk to himself, um, came to visit Paul. And so Paul recognized that. He continues these things. Erastus abode in Gorinth, but Trophimus I have, have I left at Mil Militum sick. Erastus was sent with Timothy from Ephesus to Macedonia while Paul was in Asia for a while. That's in Acts 19. And he apparently... He's described in Romans 16 as the treasurer of the city, and that confuses a lot of scholars. Maybe there are different arrestances. The other thing that seems logical is that he may earlier have been this very prominent position, he became a believer, and he's just identified with that label of his previous office, if you follow me. Arrestus is the treasurer of the city. Sent, you know, he sent greetings to the Christ, uh, Christians in Rome. And Paul may simply be designating him by an office he once held which he gave up to engage in missionary work. That's one conjecture of the authors that makes sense to me, but we don't know for sure. Do thy diligence to come before winter. And uh, it could be because he wanted that cloak that he talked about a few verses ago. There are some commentators that make that. That's their con well, he just wanted a cloak because it's going to be cold. No, there's another reason, I think. I think he was more concerned about the sailing conditions in the winter. Try to come before the, it re you know, the, the, the Adriatic gets pretty rough in the winter. Uh, and Buddhist Greece and Pudence and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. You know, with all the people that are, dis you know, that abandoned him, it's nice to find someone there that was true, and apparently Eubulus was one of those. But these people are something else again. Claudia, she's mentioned with Pudence, whose wife she afterward became. He was a Roman knight. She was a Briton, surnamed Rufina. In 1772 according to some accounts that I've dug up here, a marble was dug up at Chichester mentioning Cogedanus, which is uh, surnamed Claudius from his patron emperor's name. Pudence is also mentioned Cogenus, son, his son-in-law. So he becomes his son-in-law. So 
The daughter would be Claudia, probably sent from Rome for education as a pledge of her father's fidelity. There she was put under the patronage of Pomponia, the wife of Aulus Plautius, the conqueror of Britain, quite a famous guy. Pomponia was accused of foreign superstitions in AD 57, probably Christianity is recorded as a foreign superstition. She may have learned Christianity from Ponia, who took from her the surname of the Pontanian clan. All of this is in Tacitus Annals. You say, gee, that's pretty impressive. Well, be careful. Lots of different scholars have different views of some of these. Um, they build these elaborate theories from little hints there and there, and they may be right. But I'm always reminded of the danger of make, coming to vast conclusions from half-vast data, okay? <laughs> You've got to say that very carefully, right? Linus, there is a tradition that Linus was a bishop of the church at Rome. A list by Irenaeus, one, roughly uh, second century before Christ, I mean after Christ, uh, commences with Linus, whom he identifies with a person of a name mentioned by Paul and whom he states to have been entrusted with the office of the bishopric by the apostles. So this might have been that Linus. You know, Irenaeus thought so, and he wasn't that far removed. But the puzzling thing is, why is Linus listed between Claudia and Pudens, if all that other stuff was true? So something doesn't quite compute here, and I'm not make, it's not that big a deal one way or the other. I want you to be aware of the fact that you can dig in through some of the research uh, uh, helps and get some glimmers of ideas, but they're not necessarily trustworthy or really solid. They're just conjectures by various scholars. So we wrap it up. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. And the second letter to Timothy uh, ordained and the first bishop of the Church of Ephesians was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. And so ends this. And uh, so, now there's a couple of things about before we leave this last verse, I think that are useful to notice. Christ be, Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. That word in the Greek is singular, Okay. Grace be with you is plural. Uh, what, what do you make of that? See, on the one hand, all that other stuff I don't make too much of. This I find interesting because it proves that the letter was intended to be read by the church. The letter is to Timothy, but he offers grace to all the readers. So they were intended to be circulated. And they were regarded by the early church as scripture. We need to understand that. There's proof of that in the text. Okay, so for the next session, you want to read the epistle to Titus. And uh, with that, we'll stand for a closing word of prayer.